Welcome in to the Paul Kuharski podcast. I'm Paul Kuharski of paulkuharski.com. This is a production of 440 Sports. I have mentioned my name three times, fulfilling all obligations, and we are ready to go. We're going to discuss actual speed for the Titans, um, like guys moving fast, um, player peaks, and what they mean from Tim Kelly's perspective. Weak special teams expectations from your guy, Craig Aukerman. Thoughts on succession, some of which hit close to home. I hope you're watching. Uh, We're brought to you by Jasper's, um, excellent bar and restaurant on West End, just off of 40. Um, I appreciate you joining me on whatever platform you are with us on. If it is a podcast platform, you may need to renew your subscription. We've changed. um, So be sure to hit subscribe. Make sure you're subscribed. I appreciate you redoing that for me. And away we go. Um, This team, the Tennessee Titans, is going to do, going to all ends to shine up its wide receiver group and to act as if things have happened there that have not happened or that things can happen there that cannot, in all likelihood, happen. There are two topics under that umbrella coming in this pod, and we'll start with speed. Um, They're going to make the guys they have faster by not making them think as much. And this is great. Look, you take every opportunity you have, you cut every corner you can cut to maximize everything from every guy you have on the roster. And I don't begrudge them this at all. Tim Kelly has modified the offense or overhauled the offense, however you want to look at it. And we're not going to have a full sense of that until later, though the way guys have talked about it, it sounds much closer to an overhaul than a modification the, the verbiage is down. There are shorter play calls. Mike Herndon wrote about it this week at paulkarski.com. You should check that out. Um, but much of it means guys will be thinking less. And when guys are thinking less, they can move faster. And here is Kelly talking about that. Um, I mean, yeah, if we can go up and, and again, some of it comes into, uh, our ability to go out and execute and, and play to their to their speed, whether it, that's a 4-4, a 4-6, whatever. Our job as coaches is to make sure that those guys are playing as fast as they can and, and making sure that they're playing as efficiently as, as possible. And, and um, we're in the process of doing that. But again, I think we're off to a good start. Again, that's great. But when Mike Vrabel said after the season was over, we need to be faster, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about getting faster guys. I asked the the question that Tim Kelly's answering there is, are you discernibly faster? And he paused for a minute at the beginning of that answer to come up with their discernibly faster because it's a faster offense that's going to get in and out of the huddle faster and that's going to let guys play more efficiently and be faster. But are they a faster team? A faster team has faster guys. They didn't get faster guys. They have faster guys on the offensive line, which helps them in some ways. Does it help them in the way we're all imagining? No. They needed to go get a burner at wide receiver, and they did not. They needed to be a faster, more explosive, and dynamic offense. What Tim Kelly is talking about there will help them be a better offense, but it doesn't turn them into a dynamic playmaking offense because they lack dynamic playmakers. Chris Moore ran a 4-5-3 coming out of college in 2016, and he's not as fast as that now. Colton Dowell ran a 4-4-2. Absolutely, they added speed there. He's a small school seventh rounder. Small school seventh rounders do not have big first-year impacts. Blake Bettingfield, who uh, who works with us at paulkuharski.com, worked with Colton Dowell to get him ready for the draft, and he says he doesn't expect Colton Dowell to have much of a first-year impact. Tajay Spears runs a 4-4-7 coming out of Tulane. He'll he'll add something coming out of the backfield. But the 
the get faster thing that Mike Vrabel said was a focal point for this team transitioning from 2022 to 2023 was more than a we're going to be more efficient and allow our guys to be as fast as they are. That is a minor tweak, not an overhaul. And it is uh, disappointing that they didn't do more there. I'm going to take a stab at something here on YouTube. You'll see it. And um, I hope. And on uh, on the pods, you'll listen to it. I collect pins. A lot of reporters <clears throat> collect their credentials over time. I know a lot of friends have great collages of their credentials from all the events that they've covered. Whenever I'm at something that I, I cover or at something as a fan, uh, I try to buy a pin of the venue or of the event. Um, and I've got some boxes that hang outside of my office here where I've got a lot of them uh, on display. Though when I close my office door, they fall down and then I worry about the dogs eating them and I'm picking them up a lot of the time and it turns into a huge hassle. But that's my collection thing. And I thought I'd start sharing uh, some of them. So here is Super Bowl 34. Oh, yeah, that looks like it'll come out all right. Super Bowl 34 with the uh, Georgia Peach and the uh, Super Bowl logo and Titans uh, old white helmet and the Rams helmet and the football field. So I got that uh, somewhere during the course of Super Bowl week, maybe at the Georgia Dome itself. But uh, I think a lot of you might have something like that or akin to that, whether you were in Atlanta for the game or um, did some mail ordering of some merchandise. Uh, some of you are too young to have uh, seen that game or remember that game or to have been purchasing stuff from that game. But I thought I'd start out with something big. I've got some pretty cool ones. So when I remember, I'm going to keep a list of which ones I've already shared and uh, try to give you a peek at some of them. If that's something that interests you, I thought it might be interesting. Um, on to Tim Kelly. And this is kind of chapter two of the receiver stuff that came out of the open OTA on Tuesday where we got to see a workout. We talked to Kelly, Shane Bowen, um, Craig Aukerman, Mike Vrabel, three players at the podium and a couple guys coming off the field. Um, he said, basically talked about the best of the receivers giving him encouragement that he's got good stuff to work with at receiver, something that I uh, take issue with. Here's a reasonably long clip. My question midway through might be a little hard to hear, so uh, tune yourself up to hear that part of, uh, of the back and forth. I've seen these guys play. Um, I've seen these guys make plays in, in big games. You want to talk about Nick Westbrook, you can go watch the Washington Redskins or the Commanders film, excuse me, last year when he went up and, and made a huge play for us. Uh, you want to talk about Kyle Phillips, you can go and watch the New York Giants film when, when he, he caught a play or uh, a bull route at the end of the two-minute drive to put us in position to win the game. You want to talk about Traylon Burks, you can go ahead and watch the Cincinnati Bengals game when he went up over the top on the deep ball. I mean, there's examples. You can uh, turn on the Cowboys game and go watch Racy. You can watch all the catches that Chris had. There's enough examples of all these guys making plays at this level. It's just our job to make sure that we can get them to do it consistently. Have you watched the best film of every guy in division? I mean, I think you, you watch. Those games you're talking about there, yeah. where Nick was dropping balls, where, where Racy you know, has four career catches or something like that. There's a lot of film that doesn't show what you're talking about. So what's the question there? So, so is it your strategy or your philosophy that you look at the best film and envision that's what it is? Yeah. Uh, you know, different than, than, than some people, obviously, you, you know, focusing on the negative is, is, is no way to kind of go through life. So we don't really want to do that, Paul. We want to make sure that we're doing a good job of, of helping our guys go out there and reach their potential. And again, I think as you turn on the tape, you're able to see these guys make plays and, 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 and it's at the highest level of competition. So, I've got to do a good job. Our position coaches have to do a good job of making sure that we're able to put those guys in positions consistently to where they can go and win. He says there are a lot of examples. Are there really a lot of examples of Nick Westbrook Aquina making big plays? And I mean, Nick Westbrook Aquina at least has a body of work. There are not a lot of examples of Kyle Phillips making a lot of plays. How many games did Kyle Phillips play last year? He, he was quickly out with a shoulder injury. And then he came back from the shoulder injury and he, he messed up his hamstring and he was done for the year. There aren't a lot of examples of Kyle Phillips 
making plays. Um, there certainly aren't a lot of examples of Racing McMath making plays. Racing McMath has four career catches. Well, let's get straight on Racing McMath, all right? Let's go guy by guy here because what Tim Kelly did is cherry picked. Um, and, and I mean, he understood he was doing that, but let's talk about this. He mentions NWI, uh, the play he made at Washington, right? So it's a good play. He went up and he made a huge play for us. He said, this is one 61-yard catch. It converted a second and eight. It was a great play, right? It Nick Westbrook Aquina, though, are we going to look at this one great play? Are we going to look at the 200-yard games he had that in 4% of his games account for uh, 25%, I think I wrote, of his yardage? He is tied for the sixth – last year he tied for the sixth worst separation in the NFL at 2.3 yards. He tied for the third lowest catch percentage in the league at 50%. He tied for 18th in average cushion at 5.5 yards. And why would anybody give him any more cushion? He had a half yard of uh, yak above expectation. So he got a foot and a half after the catch more than would have been expected of him on plays. Now, by the way, I, I want to make this clear, and I have not made this clear enough. I like and respect Nick Westbrook Aquina. Nick Westbrook Aquina, he's made a career for himself as an undrafted rookie free agent, now going into his fourth year. And he is a guy you would want on your team as a four slash five, as a special team guy. The Titans have put him in the unfortunate position of being a two or a three which he's not equipped to be. And so he underachieves in that role. And then we're disappointed by his performance. Well, it's not his fault. They're asking more of him than he can do, which Mike Vrabel says is not what the Titans do. We don't want to ask more of a guy than he can do. We want to ask a guy to do what he can do. He's gotten everything he can out of what he has. And that's admirable from Nick Westbrook Akine. But if you're going to go look at his one big catch against Washington last year and say we can get that out of him regularly, well, why would you believe that? He's played in something like 47 games. He's not making that catch on any kind of regular basis. That's an outlier. The two 100-yard games are outliers. So I can see you can say to Nick, look, you're capable of this. Let's get this out of you more. But you're not going to get it out of him regularly. Kelly mentions Kyle Phillips against the Giants in the opener. He grabbed a 21-yard catch. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's near the sideline. Then they took a timeout with 18 seconds left. Um, that got the Titans to the Giants 27. That's when they got dumb, and they started worrying about Randy Bullock's um, preferred hash mark instead of actually gaining yardage for him. Um, he missed the field goal. I think it was 48. They lost to the Giants 21-20. Uh, I think he's going to be a good ride receiver, but you can't say based on the evidence that you've seen from him anything yet. All right. So I, I, I you know, case is, is to be determined on, on what Kyle Phillips is going to be. Burks, Kelly pointed to the Cincinnati game. I don't think any of us have any doubts about Burks's capabilities, right? Burks, um, he pointed to over the top deep ball against the Bengals. Burks, if he can stay healthy, he has the build. He has the acceleration. He has the ability to go up over guys. He made plays against Jair Alexander, against Green Bay that were, were phenomenal in, in a big game up at uh, Lambeau Field. He's matured. He talked about his breathing and his conditioning and getting that under control with his asthma by staying in Nashville. I wrote this week about how desperate he was to get back into town for OTAs. Um, by the way, you need to schedule your flights earlier because there's a chance it's going to get delayed and it's going to put you in the situation you wound up in. But look, he couldn't get from, from Arkansas to Dallas in time to make his connection on his flight. There were no alternatives. Every car in, uh, in his section of Arkansas was leased, every rental car, by Walmart. There were no cars to be had. His agent talked to five private pilots. None of them were willing to fly on a Sunday night. 
He was going to take his agent's son's car and just they were going to worry about getting it back later. Finally, they found a private pilot who flew him at 5 a.m. Monday morning in a Cessna. Uh, and he got here, like I was told, it was damn close to eight o'clock on Monday morning, which is when guys who were coming to the to the OTA session, you know, to meetings and stuff in addition to the practice, got here in time. It shows a truly motivated guy who was hell bent on being here. I, I think all of this stuff about Burks, Burks is the one guy we're not worried about, right? All we're worried about with Burks is his health. Kelly mentions Racy McMath. He points to the Cowboys game, the second to last game last year, the sixth of the seven consecutive losses. He had a 34 yard catch from Josh Dobbs that flipped the field. The series ended on downs. It's not hard to pick a memorable catch for Racy McMath. He has four catches. Four catches in two yards. Four in 14 targets, by the way. 29% catch rate. There's enough examples of all of these guys making plays at this level, he said. It's just our job to make sure we can get them to do it consistently. They can do it more consistently. But you think Racy McMath is going to turn into a guy in year three who's going to be something completely different than we've seen from him so far? Maybe. It's a long shot. You think Nick Westbrook Aquina is going to graduate from a guy who's clearly a four or five into a two or three? Super optimistic. This is not the way to build the receiving core. Uh, you know, you can, at Burks, I've said, I, I give it to Burks. But Burks is the 18th pick in the draft. Phillips, I leave room for optimism. But to expect that, that the very best of guys is what you're going to get from guys is incredibly naive. He wants to see them reach their potential, see them make plays against the highest level of competition. Phillips has upside. NWI is what he is. Moore, Chris Moore coming in is a replacement level receiver. He is what he is. Hopefully he can be a notch better, a scooch better than NWI, or maybe those two guys push each other and you get a little bit better at that second slash third spot, the second outside spot. McMath, maybe they get more, but I, I think the guys are zero. These aren't receivers two, three, four, and five because the Titans want them to be. They are receivers two, three, four, and five because free agency was a bust this year and is going to be a bust. Good receivers don't get to free agency no matter how much money you have. And next year, the Titans will have a lot. And because the draft wasn't great at wide receiver and the Titans consistently found somebody they preferred to whoever the best wide receiver available was they moved up and got Levis, whereas if they had had uh, stayed put and not make that tr made that trade, they, they had some intriguing options, including Hyatt and, and Tillman. 12 seasons combined, the average of these guys, 16 catches, 193 yards, one and a quarter touchdowns. 12 seasons, uh, sorry, 10 seasons combined for NWI and Moore. 18.2 catches, 219 yards, 7.5 touchdowns. You're not going to get that much more out of them. Mike Vrabel at least framed it a little bit more sensibly about expecting or looking for the very best of these guys, but knowing uh, and acknowledging their limitations. When you look at it good, I think it's just being able to reinforce what they're capable of doing, but then... You know, we have to eliminate some of the some of the mistakes that are made or you know if you're talking about receivers making sure that they're playing to their strengths or what their route craft is and you know that we're making sure that we're asking them to do things that they can do one more point on Kelly all right people are making it like I'm expecting him to blast these guys which I'm not but I've heard from multiple colleagues and multiple readers that he's got to say this he does not have to say this. People make it like he's either got to praise him or blast him, like it's a binary decision, like it's a black or white thing. Listen, listen to what Vrabel just said there. He absolutely acknowledges that these guys have some limitations, which are obvious. It's ridiculous to, to ignore them. He's not pretending a great catch in Washington creates a blueprint for success for NWI. If you think Kelly has to do that, your expectations for Kelly – are too low, too limited. Your allowances for nuance are too narrow. 
he told us in Indianapolis the first time he spoke at the combine that last year's offense wasn't predictable. He didn't have to say that either. There were plenty of ways for him not to throw Todd Downing under the bus to be polite to Todd Downing without going to those ends. NWI is not going to be making the Washington catch on a regular basis. He's just not. And he shouldn't set up that expectation. All it's going to do is disappoint us more. All it's going to do is disappoint you more. And again, I said NWI has made the most of what he's got. Why set us up for more disappointment? Why set the fans up for more disappointment? Doesn't seem fair. If, if you want to say he's being nice to NWI, he's actually not being, he's not doing NWI any favors. It's actually hurting him more in the end, I think. Jaspers sponsors this podcast. It's your neighborhood bar and restaurant done better. They're at 1918 West End Avenue. It's just off of 40. It's a great spot. It really is. I go there with uh, headphones and my phone, and I sit at the counter for lunch, order a variety of things, often the bolognese, which you've heard me talk about. Um and I'm left alone to catch up on a podcast, read up on my phone, eat great service, pay me a lot of attention, leave me alone when I want to be left alone. I recommend it for a business lunch or dinner, for a date night, for a family dinner. Uh, it's perfect for all those things. Very versatile restaurant, like the versatile players that the Titans are looking for. You can go outside and play free pop a shot, shuffleboard and other stuff. You park for free. So you got free games, free parking already. You're ahead of the game. They got the big game on the big TV um, and a great drink menu, great food menu. If you're unable to go in for some reason, which is a sad development for you, they've got a grab and go market, um, which is a terrific, uh, terrific option. If you, if you got to get home and feed some people or the like. Um, so it's great for all occasions. It's close to the center of town. You're probably driving right by there if you're, if you're dealing with downtown Nashville at all. I can't recommend it highly enough. I appreciate their support of, of uh, this endeavor, and uh, I appreciate your support of this endeavor. So let's put the two together and you support them. Stop by, grab lunch, grab dinner, grab from the grab-and-go market. I guarantee you will be pleased with the product. Thank you very much. Are you watching Succession? You should absolutely be watching Succession. This uh, penultimate episode, Church and State, was just incredible TV. These two incredible eulogies given for Logan Roy by his brother and um, then by a, a son and a daughter after the first son, Roman, who's the second son, tried to give a eulogy and was, uh, you know, episode started with him practicing the eulogy. He's very flip. He's going to be able to do this, but he had pre-grieved was what uh, he said, you know, and he never really felt the loss of his father, who's a mean guy and he's tough on his kids and all of that. But then he gets up to try to give this eulogy and finally looks at the casket and kind of hits him that his dad's gone, that his dad's in this casket and he breaks down, ha has trouble and can't do it, <clears throat> which is a really bad development if you're trying in this power struggle to, to be the successor for your powerful dad, battling it out with your brother and sister. And so it's a really uh, effective episode. It's a bad time for him to have this breakdown with all of these big wigs uh, in the room, including probable pre president-elect who's in a fight over whether he actually won the election or not. I should have said I was going to uh, be a big spoiler here. He had said that he had pre-grieved. This really got to me personally. My dad died early this year. I've talked about it some on here. He had dementia and had been failing for some time. It was no surprise when he died. And I, I wouldn't have used the term pre-grieve, um, but I think all of us to some degree, because we had seen him in his failing state, had, uh, you know, expected that he would pass away relatively soon. I last saw him in October. He died on January 5th. Um, and, and when I got around to my Facebook 
uh, post telling people about his passing. I said, you know, just kind of saying goodbye a second time or you've been gone a long time, but that doesn't make this any easier kind of thing. And so Roman Roy saying that he had pre-grieved was kind of a semi-joke for him, but it kind of hit home for me. But this idea that you can pre-grieve um, when that actually comes to pass is ridiculous. And I think a lot of people out there listening to this or watching that show, having um, endured the passing of somebody that had kind of uh, mindfully been lost to you before they actually died, really kind of hit home. And so I was struck by that. I am really fired up for the last episode of this show, which is movie length, an hour and a half. I've been listening to podcasts and reading everything written about it. Um, and I, I'm fired up to watch it. Nobody else in my house is watching it. So it's a solo thing for me. And I'll be excited to to watch it and then read all the rehash and listen to the podcast and stuff too. But I've also got this dread when something, when I finish a good book, when I finish a good TV show, it sucks. <laughs> Because there's a there's a void and that anticipation goes away. I think it's it's like a big game, you know. Yanks haven't been in the World Series a long time for me, but uh, it's similar to that. I hope you're enjoying it on the level that I am. The writing is just uh, absolutely terrific, and those two eulogies, man, they were something else. So I don't think this series can really miss. Um, I, I don't think the finale can really miss based on uh, on how good it's been. But we'll see. You never know what the finale. The one thing they've definitely done is, I mean, that have not stretched this out. You're not like this thing needs to be over. You're like, there's a lot of meat on the bone here for them to cover in 90 minutes. On the Mike Herndon, you need to read him this week. I mentioned earlier, he's gotten into a kind of um, unwinding everything the Titans have said about the terminology changes that Tim Kelly is um, has done here for how the offense will be called and how that plugs into this more efficient, faster, up-tempo offense that they're going to be running. Uh, it's a really educational piece this week from him at paulkuherski.com. One of the many reasons you should subscribe come be a part of things um, at the site. So $5.99 a month, everything that uh, he writes every Wednesday, everything that I write during the week, um, which in includes stuff now coming out of uh, OTA open, open sessions. So come check it out for the price of a cocktail or a fancy cup of coffee. You'll get more than your money's worth. And if you had read last week's mailbag, which is from members, you would have read me saying that I expected that they would try Elijah Molden at safety. And then Tuesday, one of the big stories was that Elijah Molden got a, is getting a good look at safety. So advance notice on stuff like that from somebody who's got a good feel for what's going on uh, for this team is what most fans are looking for, I, I believe. So check it out. Christian Fulton um, is one of three guys, and I reported this as well. So I'm so negative, by the way. I had that heartwarming Traylon Burks gets himself to training camp, and the Titans have great attendance at OTAs, only three guys not there. And those were my two stories out of Tuesday. The three guys not there. Danico Autry, no surprise, grizzled veteran, hasn't been around at these things in the past. Kevin Byard, who we know is not particularly happy with the team after the pay cut requests though Mike Vrabel ran into him at the golf course uh, on Sunday and had a good exchange with him. And Christian Fulton, who's making a mistake here. And uh, Teron Davenport reported that Fulton's been training in Miami since the season ended with David Alexander, um, who's worked with LeBron James and Dwight, Dwayne Wade. Uh, he wanted to try something different. The workouts include yoga, Pilates, and stuff like that. So look, this is a good move by Christian Fulton. Mike Vrabel basically called him out publicly and said, you need to change what you're doing in the off season when you're away from here to, to put yourself in a better position, not to suffer these soft tissue injuries that make you a repeat offender. And, and look what happened to the last repeat offender. The Titans made no effort to retain David Long. Um, you know, Christian Fulton needs to come in, be healthy, have a big season, 
whether he's going to get re-signed by the Titans, which I don't think he would, even if he has a great year, but he could set himself up for a nice second contract somewhere else. So I'm sure Fulton's thinking, hey, I'm off doing exactly what Rabel challenged me to do. The thing is, he challenged you to do it, but that doesn't mean don't come around, like go do that. And then when it's time to be here, be here. He's in the doghouse to, to some degree with Vrabel over these soft tissue injuries. So go do this unique, better, different training with David Alexander to get yourself in position not to, to suffer the soft tissue stuff. And then when we gather, come be here. You know, there's room for you right now with Byard out to, to lead in this second pair. So it's a big mistake. I mean, he's not thinking particularly clearly at, at not being with the team. And it would have been terrific if the Titans had everybody. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, they got terrific attendance as it is. They've got uh, 89 on their roster right now, one open spot. And everybody is here. Six guys were inside working on uh, injury recovery stuff, including somebody like Monty Rice, who we don't know what he has, or Wesco. Um, but, you know, guys like um, Landry, Raidens, you know, still coming back from their knee stuff. Landry should be very, very far along, but obviously I don't think it's a good idea for him to be outside running around at largely meaningless OTA practices. Um, but Christian Fulton should be smarter than that. Jamalisms, at Jamalisms, uh, a smart fan who uh, writes some funny tweets, said of uh, – of Fulton training in Miami with this uh, Alexander who's worked with LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. I imagine that will be a help in his NBA career probably beats pushing sleds, but unlikely the same types of calluses are being built referring to the big story um, about the Titans conditioning that went on in phase two of uh, OTAs where guys were talking about building calluses that should help them down the road. Finally, I want to talk about special teams, which have been a real burden for the Titans over the last several years for, for quite some time. They just did not get enough out of special teams. And to hear Craig Ackerman talk, the special teams coordinator, <clears throat> just seems to me like he puts his foot in his mouth a, a lot. Um, he was asked, about his expectations for returners. If you haven't heard this, brace yourself at the incredible low standard that he sets for what he's looking for out of a punt return. The return game is we, we just got to have someone back there who can catch the ball consistently. Um, you know, we, we tried some guys out in the past and, uh, you know, we'll continue to work with new guys and find that out. And then once we catch the ball, I think when you look back at our, some of our stats, we do a pretty good job. When Kyle Phillips caught the very first one, he had 46 yards. We just got to continue to work with him being more consistent, obviously, of catching the ball. Um, and, and I'm sorry, your second part of your question, besides the return game. Yeah, um, you know, that's that's probably the million dollar question that everyone asks every year is, wait, what's going on with the kicker part? Um, but we're, we're continuing to look, um, just like the answer I said beforehand, of finding new competition. Uh, we thought Randy was, you know, he was 17 for 20 at 85% last year, which is, I wouldn't say it's the top, but it's, it's a pretty good average when you get up close to 85%. We've just got to have somebody back there who could catch the ball consistently. I mean, that sounds like the starting point for a high school punt return unit, does it, does it not? He also classified 40 to 49 as, I believe, the gold zone for field goals, the gold zone for field goals. I mean, how could these be the standards for an NFL special teams unit? I followed up asking if those low standards were really the standards. And then given an opportunity to bail himself out of that, he said, well, of course, we'd like to run with the ball after we catch it. And we'd like to hit 50 plus yard field goals. But that didn't ease the initial ridiculous answers that Craig Aukerman offered there. Uh, on kickoffs, the Titans should be waving for those 25-yard kickoff touchbacks every time. And hopefully Kyle Phillips can get back to um, get back on track catching punts, surprise the hell out of Aukerman by, by getting yardage after it. He did mention that 46-yard return. When we do catch it, 
we do pretty good returning it. But we really have to work on catching it. I mean, my God. Randy Bullock in this, uh, you know, he was 7 of 10 from 40-plus last year. I mentioned earlier he lost the Giants game. Um, Titans only tried two field goals from 50-plus last year, and Bullock only made one of them. You think the Titans offense with its limitations and explosiveness could use field goals over 50 yards? 12 kickers around the league last year made at least six from 50 or further last year, including Daniel Carlson of the Raiders, who hit a record 11. The Titans hit one and tried two. All right, so they go away from Randy Bullock, which is good. And they got two completely unproven guys, Caleb Shudak and Trey Wolf. They both have big legs. They need to get, get the Titans need to get one of these two guys in a position where they rein them in and their big leg can be reliable from, you know, God forbid, 55. Um, and, and the Titans could take cracks from there. Can you imagine if the Titans could hit a field goal from 50 or 50 plus? where they could be counted on, or maybe you find a veteran later. There's some names already out there. But catching punts and hitting field goals between 40 and 49 are not goals that are worthy of an NFL team that is not going to be an offensive juggernaut. It's not worthy of, of any NFL team. And then Ackerman says those things. I hope to God he goes back inside and Vrabel says, dude, I don't give a shit how we do in front of the media, but you got to do better than that. Don't, what are you saying? At least a good natured ribbing or something. And we all know Aukerman, you know, is, is special teams coordinator for life here. But even if you're special teams coordinator for life here, you, you, I mean, what is that? What is that? Jasper's a great sponsor of this podcast, but willing to share here and I would love to have you get on board while this thing is growing and taking off. Reach out, pkuharski at gmail.com. Let's make a deal and get you attached to this thing as well. Please join paulkuharski.com. You're missing out if you are not a member. And until I talk to you again, please, please be sure. Don't block the box, but do lock your locks. Cheers.